Good morning and welcome to Seven Vineyard this morning. It's great to have you with us. Welcome if you are joining us online um, or later on in the week. So glad that you could be with us in the way that you are. Um, so if you want to bring your drinks over, come and find yourselves a seat. Um, if there's not quite enough seats, then the setup team will put out some more chairs as well. Um, but Megan, would you like to tell us how things are going to run this morning? Yeah, okay, so we're going to start with about half hour of worship. Um, feel free to worship him however feels good for you. Um, and then after that, we're going to have a short break. Um, you can get a coffee, go to the toilets, which are outside on the ground floor for men and women. If you go up the steps, they're on the first floor. Um, and then after that, Owen's going to come and speak to us. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> yes, he will. <laughs> I don't know where he is at the moment, but he's just having a little chat at the back. But he will begin to speak to us. Yeah. Anything else? Um, and then there's We've, an opportunity for, for prayer at the end. If you've come and yes. you'd like a, a prayer, then we'd love to pray with you um, at the end. But um, why don't we start by standing? Um, and I'm just going to pray as we come into worship. And then feel free to stay standing or sit down if you'd like to. Um, but as we come into worship now, I just want to start with uh, Psalm 100. So you may want to close your eyes just Fix your thoughts and gaze on Jesus now um, as I read this in our prayer, and then our, the band can carry on. So, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And Father God, we do come today just to give you our thanks and praise for all that you are, for the, the wonder that you are, the awesomeness that you are, that you are great and you are good and you are faithful and you are loving. And we come into this place knowing that life itself is simply your grace to us that you give us so many good things, and we are so grateful, and you do that because you are good. And so we come to connect with you today. We come to allow our heart to be touched by your heart, and we just say, come and do whatever you want this morning as we sing praises and thanks to you. Come, Holy Spirit.
You have to pray in a bit as we step into a new year. What, um, what God has on our heart for worship. I'm just really feeling like this. Um, there's a freshness. Um, it's time to um, raise our expectations for what God can do when we worship. It's not just a nice feeling that might come for a few minutes. But God's really going to move. Just as we're singing this, I just want to sing over our church this next season for His Spirit to break out, to break those walls down, whatever those walls might be. Another one of these. Um, expectation that we're not maybe not expecting anything to happen when we come and worship but whenever we come to worship God moves just want to encourage you to take this moment as we sing through this song just to ask the Father to come to be a part of our our community as we worship to begin to move to begin to give us dreams again to give us healing where we need it, hope where we need it, and joy.
Father, I thank you that we, we can't outgive you. You're always worthy of more. But as we come to worship and to lift your name and to focus on you, 
And to give you the glory, you turn around and give back more. All you want is to be close to us. And God, we say we want to be close to you. And we ask you to show us more in this season of worship and invite you to um, place dreams on our heart for things that we want to we want to see happen and things we wanna we wanna step into. And that there'll be favour on our on our dreams and our and our vision going forward. Amen. Great. Would you like to take a seat? Megan is going to come. Hello. Welcome, everybody, especially if you're new today. You're really welcome. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do some notices now. Um, I've got them on my phone, so I don't forget them. <laughs> So the first thing to say is if you're a newcomer, we would love for you to come to a newcomer's meal with Owen and Claire, who are our lead pastors here. Um, it'll be a chance for you to get to know a bit about the church and the vision. Um, if you're interested in doing that, um, if you go to the um, desk or look online, all the information is there. Um, our mission as a church, is we have three priorities. Investing in relationships, investing in spiritual and emotional health, and investing in our city. Um, and there's lots of ways we do this. Um, again, all the information is on the website. Um, but there are triplets, which is a chance for praying in a group of three. There's community groups of all sorts and shapes and sizes. Um, and it'd be great if you, if you want to get involved more, this is a great way of doing it um, with the church. So, uh, yeah, as I said, all online that. Um, yeah, we also uh, only exist through the generous donations of people who come. Um, if this is something you'd like to do and give financially, again, that's available online um, and it's very easy to do so there. Um, things to know that are coming up. There are quite a few things. So there is a leaders meeting tomorrow night at Totterdown Methodist Church. Um, that's happening, yeah, Monday night, 8 o'clock. Um, next Sunday is going to be an all-in, um, which means all the kids, all the families are in this space, um, and we do church a little bit differently to this. Um, and then the following weekend is going to be our Vision Sunday, um, which is where we reflect on the past year and all the things the church has done, um, and share the vision for the year coming up ahead as well, which is very exciting. Um, Finally, there is going to be a new toddler group starting, oh, which Claire is going to talk about in a moment, so I shouldn't have said anything, <laughs> um, to be continued later. Um, but the last thing to mention, which is a great resource for us all to use, is uh, there is a box set binge Bible that is now available on um, our website. It's basically going to be 100 minutes of um, great listening I believe it's listening um, which you can access in whatever way you want so you can do it all in one in bits in whatever suits but it's a way of connecting with the Bible at your pace um, and a way that will affect you um, so it's a great resource out there um, and it's online and available for you all to access so I'm going to hand over to Claire now I think to tell you about a few more things Brilliant. thank you Megan well done Oh, okay, I can mention that. Yes, um, do join us with that box set binge because it's something we can do as a community together. So um, when Megan says 100 minutes, 100 minutes a week, and it's split down into daily chunks so we can do it in one, one go. Um, at the end of each week, there'll be a podcast as well, and at the moment it's Owen and Byrne chatting about what they've got out of it the previous week and what we're looking forward to in the next week. So it's great at the beginning of the year um, to do this together, but you can join in at any point as well. Um, yes, car park tickets. If you've car parked in the NCP car park on Rupert Street, um, then do pick up a voucher on your way out from the host team to cover the cost of your parking and just put that into the machine instead of the money. Um, great. So there's a couple of new things coming up this week. So if you could give a round of applause and welcome Shelley and Eliza. Thank you. <laughs> great. I'm going to go for Eliza first. You can carry on your dancing if you like, Shell. <laughs> Great. Great. 
Lovely, thank you. <laughs> so, Eliza, um, you are part of the Deep Chat community group. Yeah. Um, can you tell us, a oh, it's run by Chris Simmons. Chris is actually up with the kids this morning, having lots of fun up there. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Deep Chat? What's the aim of the group? What goes on? Sure. I think, tell um, else, not me. <laughs> I think Deep Chat is really for anybody who wants to go deeper in their faith, who has questions about faith and church and how, how things work. And I think it can be really useful for anybody who's maybe going through a hard season and mm -hmm. needs, needs a deeper kind of revelation of God to mm -hmm. anchor them through it, but also for people that are just curious and hungry. Yeah. It's, it's really good for that because it's just a really nice, safe, community to explore Brilliant. questions and um, we don't always agree with each other or with the great. material that we're reading but fantastic it's a fine place to kind of dialogue Brilliant. So here you're saying this is a safe place. Yeah. And it's about being able to discuss. It's not about having all the answers, but it's a place that you can individually and together just work through things, unpick things, and any question can be asked, and nothing is out of bounds. Exactly. Fantastic. So for you, Eliza, how has being part of the group impacted you? How has God been working in your life through that group? So for me, I particularly loved um, some of the books that we read. We read um, basically misreading scripture through Western eyes. And for me, that really helped me to kind of explore the assumptions that coming from, you know, the West that I make about God and the Bible and kind of just see more about the context, mm. which I think really helped me to see God more. Brilliant. And also, we, I also really love doing a more Christ-like God, which I guess really helps to, it helps me to look at the Old Testament with like a lens of Jesus. And for me, going, going deeper, asking these questions, it, it just increases my awe and wonder. Brilliant, brilliant. And gives you that fresh perspective, yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. Brilliant, Liza. So you're about to start a new series that Chris is running, yeah. but um, tell us what it, what is it? So it, we're going to be listening to a podcast um, kind of around the book of praying, sorry, of living like monks and play, praying like fools. And so I read the, the book, sorry, just to clarify, living the, like a monk, and praying, praying like, like fools. fools. That's yeah. a book. Yes, okay, and that's now there's a book, podcast. but there's a podcast that has been kind of created, I think, with the author and some other people exploring the book and the themes that come up. We're going to be listening to the podcast. You don't need to have read the book before. Um, but my understanding from having read the book is that it's really just going deeper into some of the questions that people have about prayer um, and you know so things like when god doesn't answer prayer and exactly like that. brilliant why god doesn't okay. answer prayer when it feels and like that what's the point of prayer when it feels dry and you're unmotivated okay. and it's actually prayer is one of my favorite things to explore about god so i'm really looking forward to it great so if you are interested in being in that safe place where you can just ask any questions but going deeper with prayer but maybe asking some of those difficult questions um then you are so welcome to join the group it is starting it's starting this tuesday on the 13th 7 45 to 9 30 p.m brilliant so this tuesday based in saint paul's if you'd like to come along, what do they do? Uh, then you would go onto the Severn website and sign up on the core community list for Deep Chat, and Chris will get in touch with you and tell you how to get there. Brilliant. So sign up by the website or speak to Eliza or Chris. <laughs> Brilliant. So you're so welcome. Fantastic. Thank you, Eliza. Give her a round of applause. Now, Shelley's a little excited, you might be able Hello. to tell. <laughs> So, oh. Shelley, tell us what's starting this We've week for been, you. I've been praying for this for such a long time. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Yes, well, <laughs> so it's a toddler group. I know Yay. you might think, oh, it's just a toddler group. But no. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
It might be the battery. Oh, okay. Okay. Not Isn't it my husband cutting me off? <laughs> He's on sound today. So, um, yes, yeah, so a toddler group. So, we, yeah, so I used to do, I used to head up um, Vineyard Kids, and it's um, something that I used to do in um, my old church in London, and, um, and I was given the brief in my old church of just, um, I was given one toddler group, and I ended up running six toddler groups oh. and they were all had a separate people so we had 60 to 80 separate people in each group wow. and then we had yeah six groups so, so we had a huge amount of people coming through those doors so this has always been a big thing yeah, in your a heart big that you're thing. very passionate about yes, you, passionate you love thing. it when you see that it's yes. done Done well. Yeah, yeah, done regret. well. Yes. And it's, it's just a, a time where you get lots of people coming in and you uh, just get the opportunity of sharing Jesus, but also just sharing life. You get, you get to chat with people, share life, give them a nice cup of tea, nice bit of cake, and give them an opportunity where they can just go, oh, you know, and in a safe, a mom, lovely that environment. Is that's yeah, often yeah, definitely what you need. So yeah, and and so we have got funding um, to yeah to be able to run toddler groups on a Tuesday and a Thursday at Totterdown. Okay. Yes. So starting this Tuesday. Yes. And but this not Thursday this, okay, so this until this following week. Thursday. Okay. For, because of issues. Totterdown Methodist Church. Yes. What time? So from 10, yeah, there's always issues. <laughs> but, um, so they're not my issues, but there are issues. But um, yeah, not my issues this time. Um, so <laughs> so that, that, not that I have very many issues. Just, yeah. <laughs> what, what time, Shelley? <laughs> Oh, we're talking about the issues. <laughs> 10 o'clock. Um, 10 o'clock until half, t half 11. Brilliant. And um, what else so do you So you can say? know that if you come at 10 o'clock yes. to half 11, you're you going to get a cup of tea, a nice bit of cake. cake, someone to chat to, yes. and lovely and environment for your children. Hopefully it'll be warm, but we'll get you to run around. And... Um, and, and singing. I'll get you to do some singing. So. Yes. And can people, do people have to live yes. in Totterdown to go? No, you don't. And you don't have to have children because I'll get you to have, <laughs> don't be too embarrassed, please. Sorry. Is your daughter embarrassed by you at all? <laughs> 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 um, no, but if you don't, if you don't want, if you don't have children, you think, oh, I don't have children. I can get you to help because <laughs> you, you can do some washing up, or you can you, can, or you can help um, with the toys. You know, yeah. like pack away the toys, or you can help if you really would like to chat. Some of them come and they don't have anybody to talk with as well. Yeah. And I would love people to come, you know, to come in that building and leave saying that I've talked with somebody, you know, I've spoken with somebody. Um, I don't want them to leave that building not spoken with anybody. So. so you know that you're all welcome. It's going to be fun on Tuesday yes. morning at yes. 10 till 11.30 yes. at Totterdown starting I'm Tuesday. sure there's something. Oh, yeah, and after half term, we've also been, in, been given um, funding um, to start a support group stroke parenting course Brilliant. which has also been on my and heart to do. I can tell you a little bit more about that in the weeks Yeah, come. yeah, so yeah, that's, and it's all, all connected with Storehouse as well, so I've got added funding for that as well to, to continue that. <laughs> so I'm Brilliant. sorry for looking at you. That's not that to do with you, Dan, sorry. Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> this is why I don't do the notices. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks so much. Fantastic. So we're going to have a short break now. Um, please grab a coffee. Please chat to somebody that, um, that you know or don't know. Um, pop to the loo if you need to. And Owen's going to come back in about five or six minutes. Brilliant, thanks. Good morning. Can I interrupt your conversation? Sorry. So sorry to do that. Good morning. If you're watching from home or you're listening in the car, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, good night. So nice to see you all. Uh, Happy New Year again, if I've not seen you since uh, we came back from Christmas. It's great to be here. My name's Owen. I'm one of the co-lead pastors of the church. And I want to ask you the question, who loves January? Oh, yes. I've got some fellow brethren in the room. I love January as well. I'm really optimistic and, and positive at this time of year. Sorry if you're not. Um, I, I love it. I am full of excitement. Uh, I've got a whole new year ahead of me of possibility and potential. Isn't it exciting? Um, I'm even excited because maybe inflation will come down and interest rates will come down. Maybe even 
uh, we will have a change of government this year. And uh, some of you, uh, you know, are probably thinking to yourself, hang on a minute, where's this going? You know, the truth is, isn't it, that um, uh, politics and the economy are, are not easy things to put your trust in. They are not always reasons to have hope. And, um, and there's a couple of reasons I would suggest for that. One is, one is that things change, right? I mean, we, there's no guarantees that, um, that inflation won't go back up again or interest rates won't stay high. There's, there's no guarantees that the conflicts uh, that we're currently seeing in the Middle East um, and indeed in Ukraine and Russia is, is actually going to get less and, 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 and peace is going to break out. There, there's no guarantees of that, okay? These things are not easy things to put our hope in. But also... These things are not easy things to put our hope in because we all have different circumstances. So what's good for me might not be good for you. So, for instance, I'd quite like interest rates to come down because I've got a mortgage. Um, I, you might have savings accounts and no mortgage, and you'd quite like interest rates to stay high. You might quite like your current occupants of Downing Street and the White House, and you don't want them to change. So there's, we all live in this kind of wonderful, diverse world where... Um, uh, the, the, the sort of things that we might put our hope in um, aren't always as solid as they might seem. And um, as we look to 2024, I want to ask you uh, to consider that we need to put our hope in something more permanent and universal than politics and the economy or whatever else that we might put our hope in. Now, as with all Christian sermons, the simple and short answer to the question do we need hope? And who should we put our hope in? Of course, the answer to that question is Jesus. Well done. Right. Okay. So that's it. I've done my talk for today. Of course, the answer is so often Jesus. And, um, you know, I'm not suggesting for a minute that's not the case. However, um, the idea that uh, Jesus is the solution to all the world's problems can become a bit of a cliche and lose its power. And so today, I want to offer you some thoughts on why I do think that Jesus is the permanent and universal basis for hope that we should find uh, uh, confidence in putting our hope in this year. Um, and I want to do it as a preface to our new box set series that we're starting uh, this term on the book of Acts. We're going to be going right through the book of Acts. And uh, I want to talk today about why Jesus is a permanent and universal basis for hope um, as a preface, as a preamble, if you like, to study in the book of Acts. Now, if you don't know the book of Acts in the Bible, it's actually in the New Testament. That's the kind of the, the last sort of 20% of the Bible, um, at the back of your Bible if you've got a paper Bible. And um, it's actually part of a two-volume box set or a two-series box set. Um, uh, according to uh, scholars, it's written by a person called Luke. They're not to totally sure he, uh, who this Luke is, but it's written by a person called Luke. The first volume is called Luke, and the second volume is called Acts. You cannot separate these two books. They're written by the same person, and even the start of Acts is a bridge from the book of Luke. Okay, so think of Luke and Acts as two volumes uh, by the same author. And uh, I'm going to read to you, first of all, from Acts 1, verses 1 to 2. And this is what we call the message translation. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the Bible, there's lots of different versions or translations of the Bible. Um, and this message version is designed to be understood in contemporary English. So Luke writes this. Dear philosopher Theophilus, in the first volume of this book, Luke... I wrote on everything that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he said goodbye to the apostles, the ones that he'd chosen through the Holy Spirit, and then was taken up into heaven. So he, he makes reference to the first volume. So that's the bridge, first of all. And um, as I said, scholars aren't entirely sure who Luke was, but I think most scholars would agree that it's probably a friend of the Apostle Paul. Now, if you're familiar with Paul, Paul wrote all the letters, well, not all, but quite a lot of the letters in the New Testament um, things like Corinthians and Thessalonians and Romans. And they think that Luke was one of his buddies. Why? Because Paul actually references Luke in one of his letters, in more than one of his letters. The reference I'm going to give you now is Colossians. So if you've got a Bible, just switch to Colossians 4. You'll see it on the screen if you don't anyway have a Bible with you. And it says this, a um, bit of a preamble, but we'll get to the point in verse 14. So this is Paul talking. 
and writing in his letters to the Colossians. And he's writing to them at the end of his letter and saying this, my fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Jesus, who is called Justus. Yes, Jesus wasn't just one person. As you know, Jesus is a very common name. Jesus, who was called Justus, also sends greetings. There are own, these are, are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, by which he means Gentiles, so he's making a difference here between Jews and Gentiles. So he's saying that Aristarchus, uh, Mark, um, and Jesus, they're all Jews, um, but they're the only ones amongst his co-workers who are Jews. And then Epaphras, who is a Gentile and <clears throat> a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings, and our dear friend Luke, the doctor, <clears throat> sorry, a bit of a gravelly voice, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas also send their greetings. Now, this is really important. When you're reading the Bible, there is some continuity between what's written about the, who these people are, and certainly the letters of Paul are really well verified. And we're not talking fiction here. We're talking about actual letters about actual people. And so what we're seeing here is, is that it appears that Luke is one of uh, Paul's companions. He's a Gentile. And what also is interesting is that he looks like he's a trained medical doctor, whatever that looked like in first century um, uh, Eastern Mediterranean. I mean, honestly, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you that right now. But it does chime, he, the fact that he's a doctor does chime with Luke's desire to present an accurate picture of Jesus as possible. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so scholars think that Luke was writing this letter either to a person or a group of people because Theophilus actually means God lover. So it could be just a group of God lovers, you know, almost like a play on words. Um, they were probably living in Rome. Why do I say that? Well, because um, Luke ends the, uh, the, the two volumes of his work um, with Paul reaching Rome. Now, as I said, Luke is one of Paul's companions, we think, so therefore Paul and Luke end up in Rome, which really is Paul's great ambition. Paul's great ambition is to go to the capital of the empire and preach Jesus in that place. And, and, and exactly, if you get to the end of Acts, you'll see that's what happens. So, in terms of timing, we think that Luke and Paul reached Rome somewhere around AD 60. Um, Paul died sometime between AD 60 and AD 70, um, and Luke would have been writing this around about that time. Now, it's really important as we look at the account of Luke and Acts to really try and understand as best, as best as we can what the world was like at the time that Luke was writing this. We need to try and understand what was going on in that context. Because although, as you'll hear in a moment, there is some similarity with what's happening in the Middle East right now, the reality is it was a very different world to in which you and I live now. And we need to be careful when we read the Bible to not read our present into what we're reading on the Bible. Okay? What we need to read is what, what, as much as we can what the context of the Bible is. And it's interesting as well, right now, we're, we're in a period of great investment in academia and academic research into the context, the historical context of writings like the Bible is throwing new light on exactly what the world was like at that time. And that's really important. It's helping us understand uh, the Bible and similar writings in the context in which they were originally written. So let me just give you a bit of an overview. I think it's really important for us to understand that that 130 years between 63 BC and 70 AD, okay, 63 BC and 70 AD, about 130 years, in what we now know as Israel, but then would have been called Judea and Galilee, that was a time of great geopolitical conflict and tension. And you might go, well, that's, nothing's changed, has it? Well, no, to some extent it hasn't. But back then, this is what was happening. In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey captured Jerusalem and established his rulership through a client king, or several client kings in that area. Religious conflict uh, between the polytheism of the Roman Empire and the monotheism of, uh, of Judaism, um, the oppressive taxation of the Romans, and the really unwanted imperialism was creating a festering tension in this land. Okay, which often erupted in violence, culminating in the massacre of the population and the destruction of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem in AD 70. And if you don't know that, then that's a really important moment in the history of the Jews, where the Romans invaded, they laid siege to Jerusalem, they massacred the population, they broke down the walls and they destroyed the temple. 
Fortunately, happily, Judaism, uh, rabbinic Judaism emerged out of that and continues as a wonderful tradition today. However, that was a significant moment in the history of the Jews, and it is also a significant moment in the history of the church as well. So the Jewish Roman uh, stroke historian, um, uh, who was called Josephus, he was actually one of the Jewish rebel leaders, switched sides to the Romans, but was also a useful historian. And uh, uh, even today, um, historians will look to Josephus as a, as a reliable source of insight into what was going on at this time. He said, from one end of Galilee to the other, there was an orgy of fire and bloodshed. From one end of Galilee to the other, there was an orgy of fire and bloodshed. Okay, so this was... I mean, if you think that that area of the world at the moment is in conflict, you've got to understand how much more conflict was going on at this time. And during the 33 years of Jesus' life, Judea and Galilee were like a tinderbox waiting to explode. Only uh, 37 years after... Uh, is that right? 37, yes. 37 years after Jesus died, Jerusalem is crushed. The temple is destroyed. And, uh, and we can see this boiling cauldron of political and religious tension all the way through Luke's letter. Now, if you've ever read Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, which are the accounts of Jesus' life, and struggled to understand some of the stuff that's going in there, because some of it might... I mean, if I, am I the only one that thinks some of it's a bit difficult to understand? No? Some of you are shaking your head, so no, that I agree. I, it's difficult to understand, right? There's lots of stuff in there. Even Jesus says lots of stuff, which is confusing. Why is that? Well, because we fail to understand that, that at that time, the place where Jesus was living, the, the, the environment that he was living in was a boiling cauldron of conflict and tension. And it was, only, it was building and building, and it was going to explode in AD 70 and into violence and suffering, and effectively what you might call genocide. As we can see, the Jews at this time would have been desperate for a saviour, someone to put their hope in. So how does Luke describe this? Well, first of all, Luke looks, we look in Luke 1, 32 to 33, the, the, the rather wonderful images that we, we think about at Christmas. Uh, Luke 1, 32 to 33. This is what the angel Gabriel said to Mary. Her baby will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over, his, over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Where it says he'll give him the throne of his father David, that is a political royal statement. Right? We're going re to resurrect the, 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 the royal family. This Jesus, this baby is going to be, well, he's going to be a descendant of his father David. He's going to be the king again. We're going to have a king. And that would have been in direct opposition to the Roman rule at the time. And this king would reign over Jacob's descendants forever. Jacob, we know, is also called Israel. And his kingdom will never end. These, these are political statements that the angel Gabriel is saying to Mary. Uh, Luke then repeats Zechariah's words. And again, remember, this is Luke repeating uh, what's been said um, through tradition. Luke 1, 68 to 71. Zechariah is um, John the Baptist's father. And he says this, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. A horn is a metaphor for power. A horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. It's easy when you read the Bible, particularly at Christmas, to see that in an abstract way. It's something to do with Christmas, but really we're more interested in Christmas trees and presents than we are understanding that this was a geopolitical tinderbox. Okay, do you understand this? That what was going on here, I'm trying to point, point out, is, is that these statements were being made at a time when Roman occupation of Judea and Galilee was at its height. And that the anger and the resentment and the hatred uh, uh, amongst the Jews was, was, was absolutely boiling. Luke then writes about the Pharisees' anger with Jesus for socialising with the Roman tax collectors. And there's loads of examples of this, but I'm just going to give you one. Luke 5, 27 and 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. 
But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and the sinners? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now we could think, and reading that, we could think, oh, that's just a kind of, like, kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's an issue of holiness. It's a kind of uh, religious thing. Well, yes, it was, but it was also a political thing. That these were the hated people. The tax collectors were acting on behalf of the Roman Empire, and they were extracting tax from the common people, often ripping them off and taking a cut for themselves, and then really giving all this money to the, the imperial war machine. You know, this is, this is the world in which we're living, and sometimes we can fail to see the impact of these words. Um, Jesus, uh, you know, as I said, there's loads of examples of Jesus mixing with the tax collectors, and all the time, the critics of Jesus were saying, you're eating with the enemy. You're eating with the enemy with those who hate us. Although Luke doesn't actually talk about this, I'm just going to mention it anyway, because I just think it reflects the lawless corruption at that time, and that is the death of John the Baptist. Um, and... Um, yeah, I can't help but think of uh, the uh, execution of Jamal Khashoggi, the, um, the Saudi-American uh, journalist who was executed at the orders of, apparently, the orders of the Saudi king. Um, when we read about John the Baptist being decapitated because, um, because, it, because uh, Herod, who was the local dictator, um, asked his daughter what he, she would like because she want, he wanted to give her a gift, because she d- that did a nice dance for him on his birthday. And the daughter's mother, who wanted John the Baptist dead, told the girl to ask her father for the head of John the Baptist on a plate. And this was the type of thing that was going on. That is disgusting. And, and, but this just reflects the lawless corruption that uh, existed at this time. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount reflected the social and the economic inequality that was festering across Jewish society. And um, although Luke only records some of the Sermon on the Mount, we've got, we've got a more extensive description of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, but you'll be familiar with that. Um, Matthew talks about that. But in Luke, in Luke 6, 20, 21 and 24, 25, this is what Jesus says. Just listen to this within the context of great inequality and hatred and pain. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. The poverty and the deprivations of most of the population is clear to see. Uh, through, through, the, through the writings of Luke. And, and, and Luke describes, and again, you, we read the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, as a kind of, oh, it's just a wonderful miracle. Isn't that beautiful? No, no, no. This existed in a time of great inequality. These people were starving. And Jesus amassed quite a following simply because he provided food en masse. And he healed people. Like, when, when we think about Jesus healing people, he was healing the poor. He was healing those who were vulnerable and on the margins of society because of their illness. He was healing people who could not work because they had diseases or disabilities that prevented them from working. Like these were people on life's edge. And when we read about these things, we have to take off our uh, 21st century spectacles and we have to say to ourselves, what was happening at the time? It was a time of huge inequality. And we, t- we see Luke repeatedly describing how Jesus challenged this inequality. Now, as we read through Luke, it's clear that Jesus becomes increasingly powerful as a leader because of those miracles. I mean, those miracles weren't just acts of wonder. They weren't just like, if we saw someone perform a miracle, we might go, oh, that's incredible, like, whoa. But if that miracle was something that we needed, we would feel it very differently. So say, for instance, you were dealing with a, you know, a terminal disease or you were dealing with a life-altering disability or something like that, and Jesus comes along and heals you your reaction to that is very different to if you weren't in need of Jesus. 
So as you can imagine, Jesus became a very popular leader, very popular, very powerful, and the people, the crowds were following him. And again, Luke, Luke reflects this in what he says. He records a conversation between Jesus and his disciples in Luke 9, 18 to 20. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? Just note that word, crowds. Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah. Luke is clear that Jesus was God's Messiah. And as if to ratify that conversation, immediately after that, Luke records what is called the Transfiguration, which is kind of like a mystical, dream-like event on the top of a mountain that Peter, James, and John were all part of, three of the disciples. And, and, and they, they went up to the top of the mountain, and then they have this mystical, dream-like event where they see Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah, two great figures of the Old Testament, two great figures in Jewish history, as if to confirm that Jesus is this great person, not just any old person, but the Messiah. This is Luke's intention. Luke wants his readers to understand this. So Luke's thesis is this. Look, Judea and Galilee are a boiling cauldron of political and social tension, where the Romans and the complicit Jewish leaders are facing off with the majority of the population who are poor and deprived. And from within this majority of poor and deprived people, and we need to understand this, Jesus emerges as a revolutionary leader who has given them hope that he has the divine authority to overthrow the evil authorities and to restore justice and mercy. No wonder he had a following. But Jesus, Jesus was one step ahead of everyone. Jesus knew this wasn't going to end well for him. And Luke records this. Three times, Jesus warns his disciples that he's going to be killed. Three times. Here's the first one. Luke 9, 21, 22. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man, referring to himself, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. And that's just the first prediction that Jesus made. There's two more that Luke records. And this all kicks off around about Luke 9. And I don't know if you've read Luke yet or you've listened to Luke uh, as part of the Bible binge. We've started with Luke deliberately. And if you haven't joined in, do get involved with the Bible binge. I listen to it at 1.75 speed, so it's very easy to listen to. So, I mean, like, you can just do it when you're cooking dinner or in the car or something like that. So don't feel like you have to go at a kind of normal pace. Just speed it up. Because what we're trying to do is encourage you to listen to it. And, and we're trying to encourage you to listen to it. You don't have to get into the detail of it. Just listen to it. You're going to hear things. You're going to notice things that you wouldn't normally notice if you were plodding through it slowly. So stick it on 1.75 or even 2. I can't listen to 2. I can't actually hear it. But uh, 1.75, just about hear that. And, um, and what you'll notice is, is that from Luke 9 onwards, the language and the metaphors become more divisive and disturbing. And this, for those of us that are kind of familiar with Luke, this is where, you, like me, you'll probably go, actually, I find it quite hard. Because there's some things that Jesus says there, and there's some things that are going on that just seem really weird. And what we tend to do is when we don't understand them, we just kind of ignore them. We don't need to ignore them. We just need to understand the context that's going on at the time. And so what's going on is that Jesus knows he's going to die. He knows he's going to be killed because he is the, kind of, he is the number one leader against the, uh, the authorities at that time. He's leading a revolution like crowds, thousands of people are following him. Why? Because he's fed them, he's healed them, and he's preaching a revolutionary message. And so Jesus warns his disciples about the cost of following him to his death. Because he knows he's going to die. And what's more, I think he knows they're going to die for it as well. He says, are you sure you want to... There's an off-ramp here. If you want to get off, you could get off. Jesus is accused of being the devil by a crowd of people when he casts a demon out of someone. To which I almost feel like Jesus is losing his temper with them a little bit. He's like, what? What? You listen, you read it. It's like, how can, how can I be the devil if I'm casting a demon out of someone? Like, like 
a, a, a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. How, how is that even logical? And Jesus says, you know, you're a wicked generation. I find that, like, that makes sense to me in the context, but on its own, it just looks a bit weird. Uh, Jesus criticizes the rich for trusting in their wealth and, and, and for telling them that they should use their wealth for the benefit of the, other people. Uh, Jesus did not mince his words. He really didn't. They were living in a very unequal, divided society where the poor were suffering hugely and there was just a small group of people who were enjoying the wealth. And he criticizes them. He uses powerful allegories and metaphors, stories, that is, to make his point. And, and I think, uh, Ben and I were talking about this on our recent um, edition of the podcast we recorded this week. Jesus and Luke, they use hyperbole to make their point. And, and Paul, the apostle, also in his letters uses hyperbole, exaggeration, to make his point. They were good communicators. They knew how to get the point across. And so when we think about some of the things that we read about, if it sounds hyper like just hyperbole or it sounds just like, gosh, that's an extreme example, well, it's to make a point. But not to us necessarily, but to those who, to whom Jesus was speaking. And his war of words is always with the corrupt religious leaders and the Roman stooges like Herod and Pilate, who do the bidding of the empire. You know, I want to say this as well. Jesus, uh, we've, we've heard a lot about the post office scandal this last week, haven't we? And obviously, someone like um, uh, Bates, what's his name? Alan Bates, you know, who's just, a, just an amazing example of someone who's just served incredibly without wanting recognition just to uh, right this injustice. Um, but also there was a, is it Lord Arbuthnot, I think his name is? Yeah, uh, you know, a, a member of the Metropolitan Elite, you know, who's actually kind of reached out and actually, actually has really been helpful in kind of bringing this situation to a place of um, uh, national consciousness and, and fighting for justice. Jesus isn't like Lord Arbuthnot, he's like Alan Bates. Okay, Jesus isn't one of the elite who's kind of reaching out to try and solve this problem. Jesus is one of the poor majority. And he's emerged from that poor majority. Nazareth was considered to be one of the poorest towns in the whole of uh, Galilee. And, um, and so what we see here is, is that Jesus isn't like a benevolent member of the aristocracy who's reaching out to help the poor majority. Luke is absolutely clear that Jesus is one of the poor majority who is also descended from King David. It's no surprise to Jesus. Three times he says he's going to be killed. It's no surprise to Jesus that he's killed. He sees it from a long way out. He knows the path that he's treading. He knows he's going to get killed. And he knows that there's going to be a coalition of the religious leaders and the Roman stooges who humiliate him, execute him, and under corrupt false charges, kill him. And they think that's the end of the revolution. How do you deal with a revolutionary? Kill him. Make an example of them. That's how, that's how we see it happening across the world. Authoritarian regimes, if they have a revolution, they take down the leader of that revolution. So you just look across the world, you can see it right now. You can read about it in today's press. And that's what they did. So it was no surprise that that happened, but what was a surprise, at least to everyone at the time, was that Jesus came back to life. Pretty difficult to deal with. And that is why Luke wrote two volumes on the life and times of Jesus and his followers. It wasn't because Jesus was a great politician or a great military leader. It wasn't because Jesus was a great economist or an efficient legislator. It wasn't even because Jesus was a great priest or a great teacher, although some would argue with that. We all know that politicians, generals, economists, legislators, priests, and teachers have their flaws and weaknesses. They come and go. They get seduced by power and wealth, and they struggle to maintain their integrity. We all know that's true, right? There's few that avoid it. I think Jesus is worthy of our hope. And that Jesus is a permanent and universal basis for hope, particularly as we move into 2024, which promises to be you know, a, an exciting, if not destabilizing year. Because in the words of Paul in Philippians 2, 6 to 11, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, 
being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's why Paul thought that Jesus was worthy of being a permanent and universal basis for hope. Jesus was the permanent and universal basis for hope in Paul's words, because he made himself nothing. He did not lord it over others, but he served others with justice and mercy, which of course eventually got him killed by those who he was challenging. But you can't kill that sort of life. You can't kill it. It's enduring. It's eternal. And that gives me hope. The hope that carries us through the ups and downs of life. Through our times of illness and our times of wellness. Through our times of need and our times of plenty. Through our times of sorrow and our times of joy. Through our times of anxiety and our times of peace. As we start 2024, in what will be a tumultuous year, no doubt. May our hope be placed in Jesus. Because he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He did not exploit it to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, and by taking the very nature of a servant, became made in human likeness. Why don't we pray? Thank you, Jesus, that you did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or used to your own advantage. Rather, you made yourself nothing and you take the, took the very nature of a servant and was made in human likeness. Please give us the humility to behave like that, to behave like you. And as we feel tossed and turned by the challenges of our day-to-day -day lives, the pain and the suffering that we all carry at times, the anxiety and fear that grips our lives. Would you strengthen our hope in you and make it a firm foundation for us as we get washed by the waves Conflict, of uncertainty, of fear, anxiety, and all the challenges of that life that roll across us. May our hearts be steadfast in hope in you this year. And may our lives be made so much better because of our hope in you. And as we uh, pray, I just want to encourage you to reach out in hope that God would bring peace in conflicts that you're aware of and care of the most, whatever they may be. Whether it's conflicts and pain in your own life or in the lives of those you love or conflict and pain that you see presented to us in the press every day across the world. We bring those things to you, Jesus. This sort of hope cannot be killed. It cannot be extinguished. 
it is worthy of our attention. It is worthy of our trust. If you're feeling um, anxious, if you're feeling fear, I just want to encourage you just to talk with someone you know, to pray with someone you know, to bring this stuff and raise it in the context of the hope that we have in Jesus. And may God give you freedom from that anxiety and fear. even if your circumstances don't change. And uh, I just encourage you to pray with someone you came with, or if you'd like some prayer, just um, make yourself aware to uh, myself, Claire, Megan, um, Joel, Julia, anybody you've seen up here, uh, or indeed anyone else you trust, just uh, feel free to just get some prayer this morning. Don't go away without doing that. Or arrange to meet up for coffee or chat over Zoom and just pray. Let us be a people that work together and carry each other because we have the common hope in Jesus. Amen. We are out of time, so if you've got kids upstairs and you could go and get them now, that would be super appreciated. There's coffee and refreshments still available, so do go and stick around. Otherwise, we'll see you next week for the all-in. We're looking forward to that immensely. And uh, have a great week. Take care.